Liberal Democrats have been trying to destroy the Roberts Court for quite a while now because they don't like the outcome of certain decisions. Now we have um, high-profile cases of justices taking a trip, taking trips. Two things can be true. The court probably needs to address that issue. I think they do. I believe they will. And Congress needs to stay out of the court's business. Welcome back to America Decides. That was Senator Lindsey Graham making comments earlier this summer on the potential for Supreme Court reform and an overhaul of legislation related to it. But over the last few months, Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito have faced increasing scrutiny over ethics and disclosure issues. Their detailed financial disclosures were made public today. Thomas reported several private jet trips and a vacation funded by Republican donor Harlan Crow. He also said he, quote, inadvertently omitted information from previous reports. This includes a life insurance policy for his wife, a personal bank account, and a real estate deal between him and Harlan Crow in 2014. CBS News Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford joins us now. Jan, thanks for being here. What matters in these new reports? Well, I mean, the question is, was this intentional, right? And we've seen a lot of criticism from Senate Democrats, specifically Sheldon Whitehouse, saying the Justice Department needs to investigate Justice Thomas. These clearly were willful uh, omissions that he you know, didn't want us to know about. But he makes, uh, I think, pretty clear in, in the report today and some of the stuff that he says and explaining it. And then an extraordinary statement from his lawyer saying this was totally inadvertent. Uh, under the old rules, uh, he got guidance from court officials that he did not have to disclose some of this private travel that he's gotten so much criticism for with his rich friends. Uh, and so now that rules have changed, he is disclosing it. So that's why we saw today he disclosed three trips on Harlan Crow, his friend's private plane. In the past, he contends he did not have to disclose that, and that's why he didn't. Uh, we also saw him try to clean up some of the stuff that, again, he thought uh, he says was an inadvertent omission, as you uh, pointed out. And so he cleaned that up. Uh, so I think, you know, there's really not a lot of there there that this was willful. I mean, that's his attorney's argument. And I think short of that, what we see is kind of this drumbeat now on the Hill that the Supreme Court needs to have some kind of code of conduct on its own. It's a way of focusing attention on the court, certainly by Democrats, because, you know, they're very unhappy with the direction of the Supreme Court. And some of the decisions are completely at odds with what they think a Supreme Court should be doing. And that's why you're seeing a lot of calls also to increase the membership of the Supreme Court. You've covered the court. You've written books about the court. For those of us who are not steeped in it day to day, like yourself, what is the constitutionality of oversight of the Supreme Court? Uh, where, where does Congress have a role, if any, the Justice Department, if any? You know, some of the, as you, and as someone who's covered this town a long time, uh, as you know, you can find an expert who will say almost anything. Uh, and so you're going to have experts who say, well, it's probably constitutional. Congress can have a role. But then you're going to have other people who say, absolutely not. I mean, separation of powers is super important. And there is no way that Congress can come in and have oversight over the Supreme Court and what its justices do or don't. And my guess is the justices will agree with that. Uh, so it's almost less kind of like, can they, you know, discipline justices? I think their argument would be absolutely not. But the justices themselves are under now kind of the microscope and the pressure to adopt this code of conduct because of all of this drumbeat of criticism now that you're hearing. Justice Kagan this summer talked about it uh, at an event, and she said, look, yeah, it's, it's no secret that we've been discussing this. We've been discussing adopting a, quote, code of conduct. Uh, but there's a division. You know, there's nine people, and you know, it's hard to get nine people to agree on anything. So I think that's where the court is now, and that's the direction they're moving in, something voluntary that certainly would not involve, you know, any kind of like, uh, you know, sanctions or any ability for Congress to, to hold them to account. And should the court make its own new code of conduct that's not necessarily legally binding? It seems like the only action I've ever seen Congress in history take with the court is it could impeach a federal judge, including a Supreme Court justice. It could remove them from office. Uh, but otherwise, there's very limited oversight. And I think that's why you're seeing some of the language now that you're seeing from Justice Thomas and his supporters who are saying, like, listen, I mean, you've heard some uh, Democrats on the Hill suggest maybe Justice Thomas should be impeached because he hasn't disclosed some of this. You're starting to see some pushback now. The, the statement, the release of this disclosure report today and some of his language, his attorney's language, there was a, 
a letter signed by 100 of his law clerks saying he's a man of integrity. There's no evidence uh, that there was any kind of conflict of interest, that he was any kind of pay for play. These are friends of his. So I think that's why, you know, people are just trying to say, like, okay, enough of this. Enough of this, you know, weaponization of ethics reports, as his lawyer put it today. Uh, what are the facts? It was unintentional. It was inadvertent. He's going to disclose these trips going forward starting today, starting with this year's report. And that's what he's done in his, in his filing. You've covered Chief Justice Roberts, and you've really put an emphasis on understanding him. The court has now walked into this turbulent moment, at least in terms of how the public sees it. Uh, maybe not legally. Uh, how does he see it, or at least his associates and allies see this crossroads for the court? Oh, I think it's absolutely terrible. I think they all realize that it's a real problem for the court because the court's legitimacy turns on whether or not the public is going to accept its opinions and see them as legitimate. Now, you know, I cover Bush versus Gore. I mean, I've been around for a long time. That was a very controversial decision that divided people along partisan lines and the justices, by the way. Um, but people accepted that. Would that happen today in the climate that we're in, in the polarized climate, in the era of social media? What if this court decided Bush versus Gore today? I, I don't know. I mean, that's a really troubling question with all of our institutions now kind of under attack, uh, being undermined. And I think that's a real concern, whether you're on the left or the right. Uh, any efforts now to undermine the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, are, there are things that you should take really seriously. And if you're accusing justices of, of wrongful behavior uh, or making allegations, uh, you need to make sure that you really have something to back those up because it's a troubling uh, point, I think, for our whole democracy. And I think the justices are all well aware of that. Jan Crawford, we appreciate your reporting. Thank you.